Joining me now, just back from Vietnam, is the president's national security advisor, John Bolton. Ambassador, welcome back Glad to Fox to News Sunday. Well, uh, following the failed summit in Vietnam, where does diplomacy stand between the U.S. and North Korea? What is President Trump looking for, and what is he willing to give? Well, I don't agree at all that it was a failed summit. I, I think the obligation of the president of the United States is to defend and advance American national security interest, and I think he did that by rejecting a bad deal uh, and by trying again to persuade Kim Jong Un to take the big deal that really could make a difference for North Korea. As the president said, sometimes you have to walk away, and I think he made a very important point to North Korea and to other countries around the world about negotiating with him. He's not desperate for a deal, not with North Korea, not with anybody, if it's contrary to American national interest. Well, I want to pick up on that, though, because apparently it had become clear in the negotiations over the preceding weeks and then finally days before Hanoi that the North Koreans were asking for a much greater sanctions relief than the president was willing to give. Under those circumstances, did it make sense to even hold this summit? Well, you never know what the North Koreans are actually going to come with or if they're going to adhere to it. And a big part of the problem here in all these discussions where the experts are saying, well, the North Koreans will give up part of their program and the U.S. will release some of the economic sanctions uh, that has bedeviled prior administrations is the problem of incommensurability, that we're talking about things that don't have common measurements. And what North Korea has done consistently in the past uh, is promise to denuclearize and then, by the way, not do it, to get economic benefits which provide their economy a lifeline get them out of the trouble they're in and then allow them to go back to the nuclear program that kind of mistake is exactly what president trump said he would not uh, permit in his administration and he did not do it you didn't really answer my first question i'm now realizing which is <laughs> where do things stand and what is the president what does he want and what's he willing to give uh, what he has said from the beginning, that uh, North Korea, uh, if it uh, makes a strategic decision to denuclearize, can have the prospect of a very, very bright economic future. The president held that door open for North Korea and Singapore. They didn't walk through it. He held it open for them again in Hanoi. They didn't walk through it. He's ready to hold it open again. No fixed date for a third summit. But he's turned traditional diplomacy on its head. And after all, in the case of North Korea, why not? Traditional diplomacy has failed in the last last three administrations. Uh, he was you would willing agree it has failed so far with you, too. Well, after eight months, I mean, he's, he's got a record of 24 years of failure to stop North Korea from making progress on its nuclear program. But would you agree that so far this move with Kim has failed? I, I don't think we're in, in any worse shape than they were in past administrations. I think, in fact, we're in a stronger position because the maximum pressure campaign, as it's been called, of putting uh, tighter economic sanctions on North Korea and enforcing those sanctions uh, more effectively uh, is what brought them to this point. And that, that program of maximum pressure will continue and I think have a real impact on Kim Jong-un. I, I want to ask you about exactly that because before Singapore, the president said that he would not accept North Korea as a nuclear power. And here is what you told me last April. Is there any possibility that the U.S. would accept North Korea as a nuclear power and allow them to keep some of their infrastructure? I don't see how that's possible. But this week, the president kept saying over and over again, there's no rush for North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons, to give up its missiles. The key is no testing. And according to intelligence reports, U.S. intelligence reports, in the last year, while they have not tested, North Korea has produced enough nuclear fuel for five to seven more nuclear weapons. So I guess the question is, in effect, despite what you said, what the, despite what the president said, aren't you accepting North Korea as a nuclear power, and haven't you in fact given a big concession, which is that in return for no testing, you've agreed to cancel major joint exercises with the South Koreans. No, I don't think the president sees it that way at all. Uh, the objective of making sure that North Korea denuclearizes uh, is still the policy of the administration. And I think... But then why does it say no, no rush? 
that the fact is at the moment the leverage is on the side of the United States as the economic sanctions continue to take hold. There's no doubt over a protracted period of time uh, that the time does work in favor of the proliferator, but I think our judgment right now is that time works in, uh, in the favor of the president's position as North Korea sees the effect of these sanctions taking a greater effect. And just, just briefly, can you give us a little of the mood music? You're, you're in that meeting. You're at that table. You and the president and the secretary of state and the, and the White House chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, at the same time with, with Kim and the other people. How did it fall apart? Who said what? Well, I don't think it fell apart. I think the president... Well, all right. How did, how did they end up leaving? The, the, well, they left on good terms, and I think that was part of what the president wanted. He has But, but uh, was it, you can look at this picture here. Do, were they, was it at that meeting? Who said what? They, well, it's, it, there were several meetings, and it would take a long time. But I can tell you this. The, the president uh, uh, stressed to Kim Jong-un. He thought progress had been made. He thought that there were still negotiations that were possible. I would say the North Koreans were very disappointed we didn't buy their bad deal. You know, that's life in the big city. Did Kim say anything? I mean, you remember famously uh, Gorbachev and Reagan, and Gorbachev said, what more could I have said? And Reagan said, you could have said yes on SDI in, in Iceland. Any moment like that? Well, I think there were several. The president kept saying, take what he called the big deal, denuclearization, make the decision, give up the nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, give up the ballistic missiles. He handed Kim Jong-un a piece of paper, actually two, one in Korean and one in English, that laid out what we expected there. And in exchange for that, you get this well-placed piece of real estate, as the president judges it from his business experience, that could have an extraordinary economic future. And what did Kim say? He, he walked away from it. All right. Meanwhile, the president seemed to absolve Kim Jong-un of any responsibility in the torture and death of Otto Warmbier. Take a look. In those prisons and those camps, you have a lot of people. And some really bad things happened to Otto. Some really, really bad things. Why, why are you on but the he tells me he tells me that he didn't know about it. And I will take him at his word. And well, the Warmbier family was shocked at that. And so were top Republicans. The blood of Otto Warmbier is on the hands of Kim Jong-un. And the Warmbiers issued this statement. Kim and his evil regime are responsible for the death of our son Otto. Kim and his evil regime are responsible for unimaginable cruelty and inhumanity. No excuses or lavish praise can change that. Question, why did the president take Kim's word that he didn't know? Look, the president has been very clear, both in public and I've heard him in private in the Oval Office, that he considers what happened to Otto Warmbier to be despicable and barbaric. Uh, and I think he made that clear uh, in Hanoi and made it clear subsequently. I think the best thing but, but, the but North Koreans... Me, let me just do. interrupt for a second. He says, I mean, I'm going to just read you the quote back again that we just played. He, Kim, tells me that he didn't know it and I will take him at his word. Yeah. Why did he say that? Uh, you know, what, what he's trying to convey is that he's got a difficult line to walk to negotiate with Kim Jong-un and at the same time demand what I think North Korea would find very much in its own best interest, give us a complete accounting. Uh, of who was responsible for what happened to Otto Warmbier. That would go a long way uh, to improving relations. But this is not the first time that the president has taken the word of an autocrat over outside evidence. He's not taking the word. He said, I'm going to take, I'm t when he says I'm going to take him at his word, it just, it doesn't mean that he accepts it as reality. It means that he accepts that's what Kim Jong-un said. So when he says, I take him at his word, it doesn't mean that he believes Kim Jong-un? Well, that's what he said. Uh, I think one way to prove that is to give the United States a complete accounting. Okay. Regardless of it, uh, this is not the first time the president has sided with an autocrat over, over outside evidence. Here's what the president said about the murder, the Saudi murder of Jamal Khashoggi. I hate the crime. I hate what's done. I hate the cover-up. Uh, and I will tell you this, the crown prince hates it more than I do, and they have vehemently denied it. And here is the president at the Helsinki summit with Putin on whether Russia interfered in the 2016 election. I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. Why does the president trust Putin and MBS and Kim 
over U.S. intelligence. I don't think that's what he's saying. And again, if you take the case of Khashoggi, uh, he and others in the administration have said repeatedly, we want from Saudi Arabia a complete top to bottom explanation of what happened. Uh, and it's I been months and you haven't gotten it. And, and, and the, the Senate has been calling for stricter sanctions and you guys are, are opposing it. It's certainly what happened in the case of Putin. He specifically said U.S. intelligence says this, but Putin says no. And fundamentally, in the case of all three of those countries, we've got to pursue American national interest. Uh, and that uh, involves matters much weightier, much more important uh, than some of these statements by the leaders. Look, foreign leaders who are friends of ours lie to our face as well. This is nothing new in international relations. But forgive me, and you go back to the Reagan years too, as do I. Ronald Reagan, when he was dealing with Mikhail Gorbachev over the most sensitive issues, continued to call him out on human rights and the abuses in the, in the Soviet gulags. He didn't, he didn't shy away from confronting uh, uh, Gorbachev with the tough, tough issues. I don't think President Trump has either. Certainly, as you heard, even in the tapes you played, again, on the Khashoggi thing, uh, or on Otto Warmbier, he's decried the act, acts that, are, that we're concerned about as barbaric. Okay. There are reports, that, I've got to say, there's a lot of tough stuff to talk to you about today. Two more issues. One, there are reports, none denied so far, that President Trump ordered the White House to give a top secret security clearance to Jared Kushner over the objections of the White House Chief of Staff, John Kelly, uh, over the White House Counsel, Don McGahn, and over the CIA. As national security advisor, do you have any concerns about Jared Kushner having access to the nation's top secrets? Uh, I don't have any concerns. Uh, I deal with Jared all the time on the Middle East peace process and a number of other issues. Uh, I trust him. Uh, I have no idea what the uh, story is on the security clearance. It's not something uh, that falls within my area of responsibility. But if asked, do I trust Jared Kushner, the answer is yes. You do not think he is a security risk? I do not. Other question on that, though. Will the White House meet a deadline tomorrow to turn over to the House all documents about that they're seeking on White House security clearances? Well, you know, I'm, I'm involved in that since they have uh, some nonsensical ideas about me, which I'll one day be free to discuss as a private citizen. But as a White House official, all I can say is the White House counsel and the Department of Justice are handling it, that. And uh, whether I like it or not, I will leave it to them. Meaning what when you say whether you like what, it. what they're going to what they're going to respond to the Congress Do you do you know whether they're going to turn over the paper? Or I, not? I, I don't know. I think it's up to them as I say if I were a private citizen I'd have a lot to say about this do you, well <laughs> <laughs> You know me too. Well, it's like you've dangled the piece of meat in front of me I, I, Do you think that Congress doesn't have a right to that information? I, I think look I think uh, I've been a, from my days at the Justice Department a strong proponent of, uh, of Executive privilege and the ability of the executive branch to function uh, Free from unwarranted congressional interference. So if by chance that's the stance that the White House counsel and the Justice Department take I'll be fine with that as a matter of constitutional law. I'm just saying if I were unfettered by my official responsibilities, I'd be delighted to take on these allegations about me. Okay, final question, Venezuela. For all the declarations from you and from other top White House officials that, and the quote is, Maduro must go. The fact is he continues to hold on to power. There was this big face-off last week about humanitarian aid coming in or not. Uh, they, they were able to block it, generally speaking, with some defections. The generals and the military is standing by him. One, what do you do next to try to force him out? And two, if the opposition leader, Juan Guaido, returns to Venezuela in the next day or so and is arrested, what will the U.S. response be? Look, the opposition is very united. Uh, I think Maduro made a big mistake by trying to block the aid. And let's be clear, it wasn't so much the regular Venezuelan military that blocked the aid coming across the borders. It was the colectivos, these bands of motorcycle gangs, organized and trained and financed by Cuba. That's really one of the big problems in Venezuela, which in parts of Latin America they call Cubazuela because of the influence of the Cubans that we need to get rid of. And let me just say, with respect to the military, there are countless conversations going on below the surface as to where the military will go. I think Maduro's position is very precarious. Uh, we want to see a peaceful, 
uh, transition of power. If, Gui if Guaido is arrested, what will the U.S. response be? Well, I, I, we're, we're going we're gonna to watch what happens. I think we've warned Maduro and his henchmen and the Cubans very clearly. But the opposition is united in ways unprecedented over the last 20 years. And if Maduro took that step, I think it would just hasten the day that he leaves. Ambassador Bolton, thank you. Thanks for answering all our questions. Always good to talk with you, Glad sir. Glad to be with you.